Welcome to your weekly coronavirus update. I'm ER Dr. Larry Burchette, MD, for September 9th, 2020, powered by Averpoint.com. Now, the number one question that I've gotten throughout this pandemic, both as an ER doctor and a medical expert, is when's it going to end? When is this pandemic going to be over? When is coronavirus going to go away? And that's a question that I refuse to answer until now for you. I've done my research, looked at the experts. I'm going to give you my best guess. And here's a disclaimer. It's exactly that. It's just a guess. But in talking about these predictions and the estimate, we're going to talk about the science and the process that's going to take place to get us from today, United States of America, 50,000 cases of COVID daily, new cases with a thousand deaths. It's going to take us from this high number down to where it's just about negligible, like New Zealand, a country who didn't have any deaths for three months and had a case or two every day. That's our goal, so that you can go back to life and forget this COVID thing. So let's start with some quotes. When does Fauci say it's gonna end? Fauci said, he said this in August on PBS NewsHour, if you get a vaccine into 2021, if you get a vaccine into 2021 throughout the year, I believe by the end of the year 2021, we will be as good as back to normal as we possibly can. Vaccine next year, it'll be over next year. And again, as good as we possibly can, it means they're gonna do contact tracing and, and kind of crush little outbreaks. It doesn't mean that it'll be 100% eradicated. That's not the goal, but you will, but he does say that would be back to normal. Bill Gates, in an interview, for a printed interview for Wired Magazine, he said, quote, for the rich world, we should largely be able to end this thing by the end of 2021. And for the world at large, by the end of 2022. Again, he said the end of 2021, but then he added, well, that's for the rich world. Who's gonna get the vaccine? For the rest of the world, it's going to be the end of 2022. The implications for traveling, what does all that mean? Now, look, when I was doing this research, my first reaction to that was another year of this. Who knows what it's going to look like? Kids are going to go back to school. Like, thing, It's not going to be as, 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 as clamped down as it is, but... Do want you to know that it looks like it's gonna last. Now, for those that say, look, I don't buy it. I don't believe in all this stuff. What I wanna do first is turn to history to convince you. Let's go back to 1918, the Spanish flu. That thing came in three waves, okay? Look at this chart. The first one came in March of 1918. And then six months later, look at that guy. The worst, most deadly surge of that happened as the second wave, and that was in September of 1918. And then it was followed up by a third wave in March of 1919. Some even say there was a fourth wave that went beyond. This thing lasted over a year. History tells us, now these are different viruses, but what I want you to remember from this thing is so what happened with this second surge in 1918? That was the end of World War I. And the second surge was thought to have started where they were training tens of thousands of American soldiers in these close quarters, and those guys were traveling. But it was also thought that waning public uh, frustration and, and pandemic fatigue weighed into the public's lack of willingness to continue with public health measures. Now, the famous example is St. Louis versus Philadelphia. St. Louis clamped down. Philadelphia, in late September, had a big parade. And then Philadelphia had a death rate double that of St. Louis. The point of this thing is that we're not out of this yet. Don't let your guard down now. Michael Osterholm, epidemiologist out of Minnesota, he's great. I really have learned a lot listening to him. He has worried that the United States is going to have a surge in the fall for exactly that reason, because we let our guard down, we think we've beat COVID, we get lax about masks and distancing, we go to football games, we're having weddings and all of these things, 
and then it's going to go like this. Now, there's things to argue that we're doing the right things to some of the right things to push it down. North Carolina and Notre Dame have these big outbreaks. They shut campuses down. So there are measures that are being taken to push it down. But still, this is coming. And I want you to watch out for that and look to history. Now, some people would, would, we need to take this seriously. Now, some people would look at this and say, flu, that flu doesn't apply to coronavirus. They're different viruses. I think we're done with this thing and I don't believe you. I say, so to that, I would say, we don't even have to turn to history. We can look right now and see what's happening with coronavirus. The first example that this thing is not going away and that the United States needs to be worried about a second wave is Europe, who's going through a second wave themselves. Look at Spain, okay? Spain in March was hit with a surge where they had 900 daily deaths. But then look what happened. They were able to flatten that thing down significantly to where their deaths was in the single digits in June and July, and they were down to about 300 cases daily. But then look what happened after that in August. It surged again to 10,000 daily cases. Why? What happened in Spain? Well, economic pressures, a lot of tourism. They reopened nightlife. There were large family gatherings, issues with migrant housing. All of these things resulted in another wave. The virus did not go away, even though they had so much success in getting it down to a much more manageable level. Okay, so that's history right in front of our eyes, that even when you beat this thing down, it doesn't totally go away. Even though New York and the United States, which had over 12,000 daily new cases in April with similar 800 deaths a day, New York pushed it way down single digit deaths with cases just in the hundreds similar to Spain, but that's staying down. New York is taking it serious and doing a good job. If you were just to remove, but it's still partially shut down. If you were just to open restaurants and let everybody go about, what would, what would happen? It would go up like this. So how's it gonna end? Are we always gonna be opening and closing and dealing with these things? How's it gonna end? I'm gonna answer the question of how it's gonna end in a second. But I wanna give you one more example about how the virus doesn't just go away. And that's New Zealand. We, I mentioned before, New Zealand went three months without even a death, a single death. That's insane, right? I think they've had 24 deaths total, right? The island across the street from Australia, four, four point something million people live there. And they've had 24 deaths, something like 1,800 cases. Okay, they crushed it in the summer, May, June, and July, like a case every other day. But then, so you think, oh, it's not there. They're controlling traveling, they're doing all the right things. These guys are going about and living their lives, but they have very good contact tracing. They crush, follow, you know, they follow. when you've only got a few cases, you can go crazy and follow all of them and quarantine everybody. Not when you have 50,000, like here, it's just too many. But then what happened in August? Their cases went from one or two, pup, to double digits, it's not a ton. But the point is, it was nothing and it went like this again. So they're containing it, but it's not eradicated. It's not gone. And my question was, what is it going to take for this thing to go? Well, this is the question we're answering is, what's it going to take for it to go away so we can forget about it? We're going to get to that answer. Uh, uh, there's plenty of other countries that similarly have had second waves. Take a look at Japan. Small wave in the beginning and then a bigger wave that they had to get on top of. But this is a similar story. So... What is needed for this thing to go away or at least to not be a significant killer? And the answer, I'm sure you've heard of this, is herd immunity. Well, what does herd immunity mean? I got this great uh, analogy that I'm going to, uh, great analogy I'm going to give to you. What herd immunity means is that the community at large, your local community, but really the United States, where so many people have either had the infection and become immune or had a vaccination, that there's nowhere for the virus to go and the resulting population is effectively immune and safe from the virus, okay? So even though it's not 100% of people either got the vaccine or had the virus, it's not 100%. A portion of the population has it and is immune and that protects, that provides immunity for the rest of the herd. 
Does that make sense? So <clears throat> the, the question is, what percent of the population has to be immune to confer herd immunity for everybody else? Now, the answer is it's different for each virus, and that depends on how contagious the virus is. Measles, for example, right? Measles, mumps, rubella, that's the vaccine. Measles is totally preventable. It's in, measles is incredibly contagious. For every person that gets measles, it, on average, they transmit it to 16 different people. That just spreads like wildfire. It's not like one gives it to two, two gives it to four. It's one gives it to 16, 16 gives it to I don't even know what, and it blows up like that. That's insane, right? So the level of people that need to be immune to measles, either from getting it or from vaccination, is like 96%. It's incredibly high. Everybody needs to have that. And what we've seen in the anti-vaxxer communities is that when they don't get vaccinations and that herd immunity drops below 94, 96%, you know, to a significant rate, you see measles popping up again. That's a high bar, right? 94, 96%. So that's a great case study to show we need to have a high herd immunity. The measles vaccine is an important one for preventing that thing from going around. Now, the flu is different. It's nothing. It's not nearly as contagious as that. One person gets the flu and they give it to maybe maybe one, maybe 1.5 other people. So you don't need 96%. Maybe 10% of the people get flu or 20%. So it's way, way smaller. So what is it for COVID? It's in between. One person gets COVID. They give it to, on average, two to three people. So you need more than 10 to 20% of the population to have it to get herd immunity, but then you don't need 96% like measles. It's not as contagious as measles. So some people have estimated kind of the, the going estimate is somewhere between 50 and 70%. Now people say, you know, I think New York has herd immunity now. There's not as many cases going around. That's not true because number one, there's still on partial lockdown. Not everything's opened up. And then number two, when we've studied people to test and see if they have had it and have an immune response, it's probably estimated about 15%, at the most 20% of New Yorkers, New York City, have had COVID. That's not 50%, it's not 70%. If you just opened up New York like this, there would be another spike and another surge and a whole bunch of deaths. You need it to be higher. now. You could say, well, let's just do it. Let's just get herd immunity the old fashioned way and let everybody get it. We saw what happened when we did that in New York, right? People were going, people were dying and, and the morgues were so full that they had to put them in semi-trailers outside the hospital. In general, most of us consider that unethical, although Sweden is a case study where they, they're they doing that similarly and they have a higher uh, number of deaths per million than the United States. That's really not a good option. Some have estimated if we did that throughout the whole country, just said, forget it. Forget it with all the social distancing, all of these rules, all this stuff. Who cares about the vaccine? Let's just let nature take its course. We're talking about deaths in the millions, a couple millions if we did nothing. We're already at 190,000 and we've clamped all these things down and have all these treatments and all this, all this business. Okay, let me give you one analogy about herd immunity. Here's my analogy. Tell me if you like this or not. I came up with this myself. I was listening to Osterholm on, on, on a talk and, and I came up with this. So herd immunity is like you walk, let's say you're the one that's got COVID, okay? You walk into this room where there's 20 people, closed room, you're only gonna be in there for 30 minutes or so. And, and you're covered in wet paint, wet red paint. That's COVID, that's your contagious COVID. Now, if nobody's had it yet, and you're gonna go in there and hug a few people, they're gonna get wet paint all over, right? So maybe three or four people you hug and you're in there for 20 minutes or something. Um, you're gonna get a few people, few people are gonna walk out of there with wet paint and themselves be contagious. That's if nobody, that's if there's no immunity with anybody in that room. Now with herd immunity, let's imagine that 70% of the people in there, so 14 people, are already covered with paint, but it's dried, right? So they've had the infection, the paint's dried. You hug them with your wet paint, doesn't really matter because they've already got red paint on them, they don't care, right? Maybe you're gonna hug one, you know, chances are there's a few people left, maybe one of them you hug and, and they end up getting it, but you also might not give it to anybody else. 
That's the idea with herd immunity. Don't forget, like, let's talk about the nature of what a virus is. A virus is just DNA or RNA, right? Genetic material covered by a protein. It's not even a living thing. And in order for these crazy things to propagate, they need a host and they need to be able to replicate. What if there's no more hosts? Then they can't continue to replicate and they will die out. Does that make sense? That's the key part of this herd immunity is that there's nowhere else for the virus to go. And it takes into effect how contagious it is. Remember that R naught between two and three we talked about, not 16 like measles. And so over time, it doesn't go like this. It's not done in one day, but over time it slowly goes down. Well, I don't, how do you know it's 50 or 70% the herd immunity, you know, threshold? How do you know that's what it is? This is brilliant. It's also from Osterholm. He's great. Imagine if you had now the ability to study what naturally would happen if COVID were um, unleashed on a closed system where you had a couple thousand people and nobody went in and out. We kind of do have that. They're nursing homes and they're prisons. And when you study what happens with that is you see the virus gets introduced and it rapidly replicates, it's contagious, goes back and forth. But then at some point, that spread slows. And so instead of 10 new cases per day, well, let's say 50, instead of 50 new cases per day, it starts to go down until it dies out. Now, and when it does this, it ends up not affecting 100% of that population. Now, sure, like nowadays, they're going to be doing infection control and trying to prevent all of that. But when you go back and you study these outbreaks, it's interesting that not 100% not get infected right? What happens is, is it naturally goes down and it looks like the rate of spreads, you know, it's going up, 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 but then it starts to go down at about 50%. Maybe that is when enough of this prison population starts to have some immunity and there isn't as many places for the virus to go. So it goes down and then over time, let's say it's 70%, then that's it microcosm, if you blow it up and you say, well, is that going to happen in the entire United States? Is that really comparable? No, but it does give you some insight into the kind of ballpark numbers that we're thinking about with this thing. So I like both of those analogies. I don't know if you like those or not. I hope you're not more confused just trying to unpack and relate this herd immunity thing, because that really is the key concept about when this is going to be over. It's when we've reached herd immunity. Well, how do you get herd immunity? Two ways. Number one, you get the infection and you recover and you are then immune. Now it does look like there is protection. We don't know how long, maybe it's months, is it years? You get COVID, how long are you safe from it? Yes, there have been documented cases where the DNA was taken on somebody who got it earlier in the year and later and they confirmed that they had different they got infected with different strains of COVID. But that appears to be rare. And the second time that guy got it, he wasn't sick, he was asymptomatic. So it looked like there was some cross uh, immunity protection from that. So anyway, the two ways that we raise the herd immunity, one is people get infected and they recover from it. And then two, vaccination. You know, we give them a shot that then stimulates the immune system and provides that protection. We don't want to do just the natural way because there's going to be, you know, millions of deaths, U.S., all over the world need that vaccine. A lot of vaccines are in stage three of trials where they're testing it on tens of thousands to make sure it's safe and effective. It needs to be both, right? It may be 50% effective, but you give it to enough people, that's going to make a big difference. It has to be safe. If you come out too early, like Russia saying, oh, we've got a vaccine, we're going to push it. You come out early and you hurt a lot of people with an unsafe vaccine, it's only going to make it worse in the United States for this anti-vaxxers to come to the table and be part of the solution to this thing. So that's really important too. So, okay, so big picture, 2021. So right now it's September 2020. The hope is to get a vaccine introduced early in 2021. Vaccine gets deployed to the United States. That raises the immunity and then 
over time, months, number of cases and deaths from COVID goes down. By the end of 2021, it's at a level that may not be zero, but it may be manageable with outbreak tracing and kind of suppressing things like that. A lot of what you're seeing in New Zealand and other, frankly, responsible countries that have dealt with this, uh, which we're not doing. Now, there's a lot of assumptions built into this model, and we talked about them before, things that could throw this off. I am not sticking to the end of 2021 by any means. I'm just explaining that this is what the thought is as of today. But here's the assumptions that might throw that off. Number one, if the vaccine doesn't work. Vaccine doesn't work, we're just at natural immunity time. Vaccine doesn't work if not enough people take the vaccine. So if only 20% of eligible people in the US get the vaccine, it's not gonna give up, probably not gonna give us enough to get to that herd immunity. Um, and then what if the, what if people get it, they get COVID and it does confer some protection, some immunity, but that immunity is temporary. What if it only lasts six, eight, 12 months and somebody who got it this December could get it next December and then they were immune for a while and they could get it again. This is the thought about how this thing could turn into an annual flu, right? Now, I don't wanna freak anybody out with that, but that's a possibility as to what can happen. So Osterholm has predicted, I'm gonna show this graph, there's kind of three scenarios. He doesn't think that the fall surge is gonna be as bad. You know, you can see peaks and varying degrees of managing little peaks and smoldering infections. And it looks like probably we're gonna be dealing, you know, with that for the next year. Not gonna be a massive peak like New York, but it will be hanging around at some level where when there's spikes, you, you kind of jump on them and you do mini shutdowns and contract all the things you can to push it down. And that's what we're going to be dealing with until we get this 70%, 50%, whatever the number is, herd immunity to quash it all. There you go. That's the science. That's the discussion on this thing. I know there's a lot of anxiety, worry. How am I going to do this? Look, kids are still probably going to be able to go back to school. We're going to figure this stuff out one step at a time. I want my patients to know, I want you to know this possibility because I want you to to number one, take it seriously and do your part for the big picture. I want you to stay safe in what you do. But I also want you to think about this long term for your mental sanity, okay? For your job, you know, for your own, like knowing what as much as we can, which there's so much uncertainty, but knowing that we need to buckle in for the marathon with this thing, like maybe for another year of dealing with these occasional, you know, shutdowns and we're still going to be wearing masks and all this stuff. Maybe you won't be able to travel to the third world for a year or two. I don't know, but putting it in your head, anticipating and figuring out like, how do I take care of myself? How do I stay sane? How do I pay the bills? Knowing that this thing is not going to go away in a month. Because it is it is not going to go away in a month. I think these examples of the second wave in Europe and Spain, even New Zealand that crushed it and it still came back and Japan and so forth, like we're going to be dealing with this thing. And it's better to look it square in the eye and say, okay, what am I going to do for my life so that I can deal with this reality, which may be here for a while? And that's ultimately why I wanted to make this video. Don't hold me to 2021. OK, but uh, but that's what it's but that what it, that's what it looks like. That's going to be the process kind of of, of herd immunity and vaccines. I hope this thing was helpful. If you want to look at the evidence that we uh, came to these conclusions from where we got these, where I got these ideas, go to Averpoint.com and check it out. We'll have it all listed there. My message is always the same. Stay safe. Stay sane. Do your part like this thing, please share it. I'll see you next week.